Welcome to Tech Society, a podcast about all facets of technology and our society. Twice a week, we deliver in-depth analysis from a technological perspective, giving you our take on things and interviewing people that are doing important things. Now, here's your hosts, Alex Dunmo and John Newitt. And before we begin this episode, if you think tech can solve a problem for you, go and check out NJS.dev. Ninja Software has Perth's top locally and homegrown software engineering and design talent, focusing on bespoke software for your vision. Hey techies, you've tuned in to another episode of Tech Society. Today, we are speaking with former WA Chief Scientist, Professor Lynn Beasley. Lynn's contributions to science in Western Australia are vast, and for which she has been named an Officer of the Order of Australia. She's also a fellow of the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering and fellow of the Australian Academy of Science. Lynn Beasley is a neuroscientist and educator, influential in national policy development and active within the broader community, very active in the broader community even. In this episode, we cover a range of topics concerning the state of science in WA, from academia to the role of industry in the next generation of scientists. In this episode, you'll learn the following. One the important role that chief scientists plays in educating both public and government. Two, the struggles that chief scientists encounter in their day to day. Three, the importance of teaching students skills for future jobs that don't even exist yet. And four, domestic abuse strategies that help women in the present and the long term. Lynn Beasley is a fascinating woman with a lot of opinions on some really interesting topics. Our conversation with Lynn Beasley was fascinating and you'll pick up a lot So make sure you keep listening. As you as you said, um, which I I loved and I'm stealing, by the way, uh, can you give us your from womb to to now? Okay, so you can tell by my voice I'm not Australian. I was born back in Britain in a place with probably the worst name on the planet, a place called Gravesend. Oof. That's Whoa. I know. <laughs> it was after a chap called Graves, not, not where the Graves ended, uh, but everybody <laughs> thought it was. Uh, it's just outside London. Uh, I was an only child of a family that would never have had a chance to go to uni or TAFE or anything like that. But I was lucky enough to go to a grammar school in Britain. And the, now I think it's all changed with comprehensives. But there you had to do this dreadful exam at the age of 11 called the 11 plus, which I only just scraped through. I <laughs> was told initially I'd failed, but I just managed to get over the line. And I loved science at school, amongst other things. What I remember about school a lot was I loved the practical things that we did in science. Mm. And we had one excursion that I know of, that was to Charles Darwin's house. Oh, wow. Wow. And just outside London, strongly recommend it, called Down House. Mm. And now I think it's very much more formal as a museum. But in those days, you could wander through the rooms and actually look at the things that he'd been studying. And his microscope was there. And I said to the museum man who was in charge, could I look through his microscope, which I thought was very cheeky to ask and expected (laughs) him to say no, but he said I could. And there were specimens of carnivorous plants there. I think actually they probably West Australia because he visited Albany, Mm. but I didn't know that then. But I just thought it was just everything he was doing was so amazing. And I read a few of his books a little bit by then. And I just thought, I want to be a biologist. So I was lucky enough to crack a spot at Oxford Uni. Um, and I think <laughs> I think the ex- there was a, um, an interview. I had absolutely no idea. I had no um, mentoring or information. I didn't have anybody who'd ever been anywhere near Oxford. And I stumbled on the science questions. And when they asked me why I'd chosen Somerville College, because at that stage it was five women's colleges and the rest were men's colleges, Mm. I didn't know it was the swizziest one for science. Um, I said I picked it because I looked at the road map and it was nearest the centre and it had a bus stop outside. (laughs) (laughs) Which I I think, (laughs) if you can get in with an answer like that. But I went to read botany, but I switched to zoology not that I don't love plants, but I thought there'd be more opportunities. And actually, the teaching was more exciting. 
So I was finishing my degree and I was going to go to London to do a PhD on fossils. Hmm. And I went to an evening lecture just before my final exams from a doctor from Edinburgh. And he talked about working on recovery from brain damage, which at that point was considered a no-no. So people after strokes or after spinal cord injury, there was little idea that the brain could recover. Now we Mm. hear about neuroplasticity every day. But I actually went there and did a PhD and we studied neuroplasticity. Um, I became a neuroscientist but the name didn't even exist for neuroscience then. You were either in anatomy or physiology or biochemistry. But it was really lucky because it meant I was on the beginning of a wave, mm. which was neuroscience becoming really important. I met my husband in Edinburgh, had one of our three daughters while we were there, decided we wanted to see some of the world. Western Australia offered us both jobs. We came both with two-year appointments at the Uni of Western Australia. We're still here. (laughs) And um, I just had a wonderful career doing medical research until I became the chief scientist of Western Australia. And now I'm happy just to be a science ambassador and, and help particularly young kids. My drive is thinking back, if I'd failed that 11 plus exam, what chance would I have had? Mm. And so, particularly helping young people who don't have all the advantages in life. But I had a wonderful quote once for a gorgeous Aboriginal lady working at um, Narragin Senior High School. It's not how smart you are, it's how you're smart. And everybody's smart at something and you've just got to find it. And Mm. then the world's better. So like that. that's what I live with. So, so that's, that's me. Is that? That's yeah, that's, that's great. That's a great part of history. <laughs> so you were chief scientist yes. um, from 2006 to 2013. I was. What actually is involved in being chief scientist? Well, I didn't know. Let me first of all say I didn't apply for the job. Okay. Uh, I was the second person in Western Australia to hold the job and the first woman anywhere in Australia to be at that level as a chief scientist. Yep. So good for WA. Um. As I say, I didn't apply, but luckily they asked me if I was interested. And I think they did that because I'd been a, or I was a trustee of the museum, so mm. I'd worked a lot with their scientists there. I'd led a group funded through the speed find cameras to try and look at how you could get recovery from brain damage, because so much of that happens from vehicle accidents. Mm. So I think the government knew me a bit. And I'd been on lots of national committees for the National Health and Medical Research Council and other things in, you know, of that sort of academic ilk. But the chief scientist job was very new to me. I'd never worked in government before, so that was a, a learning curve, realising that academic speak and government speak are not identical because with academics you start with a problem you work through to a likely conclusion you think you're almost right then you want some more money and you're going to do more stuff you know that would be and although wonderful breakthroughs happen but in government you have to say this is the solution I propose and this is why I'm doing it it's a different way of thinking which I had to learn I saw that it was like four four legs on a table industry government academe community And so it was working with all of those. My mantra was do science, translate science, communicate science. It's it's always, scientists are a pretty modest lot. Hmm. We don't tend to talk about ourselves and we're always putting caveats. Well, it's probably true, but there's always (laughs) other possibilities. And that's right as a scientist. Always managing expectations. That's right. Um, But you have to, not every discovery is translatable straight away but many are in ways you don't even anticipate. So for example, the development of the heart valve, which now is seen as pretty standard in in medicine, it took a hundred discoveries all the way from how nerves, impulses go along nerves to the particular compounds that you, you're using in the device. So a lot of science comes together in that translational mode, but the other thing was to communicate it, and we've seen that with COVID. Mm. It is hugely important to share, to take people with you, 
because people are interested in science, but we just have to communicate it in a way that I wouldn't be able to understand an accountant or a lawyer if they used their speak, and in the same way scientists have to reach out to as many people as they can. So it was a very varied job being chief scientist. It could be that cabinet was meeting the following week and we needed an expert opinion mm. on a particular issue. It could be anything from something medical through to erosion of, of, of port structures. You know, that could be, and of course, very important, then we were bidding for the square kilometre array, the big radio telescope. Mm. So that took a lot of my time. Um, and that was really important. But then there were initiatives that were close to my heart. Then science, technology, engineering and maths, now we think of it as, as everybody is embracing it, but then it was pretty new. Mm. And the other thing I did was initiatives for women in science. One person said he thought it was a career-stopping move for me when I did it, and I went, well, that's too bad, I'm going to do it. Why, why did he think that? Well, that was, you know, I'm a, you wonder. But there yeah. are still some people who might even say that today. I mean, diversity and equity are really important. Mm. And uh, particularly, we knew that women were dropping out of science and engineering far, you know, to a greater extent than men. Hard for them if they'd had career breaks to get back in. I just felt it was a talent pool that needed to be supported, not only for them personally and equity, but we're losing a talent, a whole mm. talent pool if we don't. Absolutely. So everybody chief, everybody who's been a chief scientist loves the job, I have to tell you. <laughs> uh, and then for me, it was the things like I visited Russia with the Premier promoting science. So there were some really exciting things I did. But when, for example, we had a um, science school of the year, I would visit that school in the first two years. It was ones in the suburbs of the metropolitan Perth, and that was fine. Then the third year, it was Christmas Island, so I visited Christmas <laughs> Island and did lots of other science things while I was there. So it's it's a job that different chief scientists will frame differently, and depending on the requirements of government, you are working with government, but you're not part of government, so mm. you have to give independent advice so it can't be compromised. But if it's so far out of the norm that it's not doable, well, that probably isn't useful advice. Mm. But it might be good advice to build a structure to get it to be doable. Was that then so a challenge with hot button issues like climate change and women in science, you know, where you are still kind of having to deal with perhaps uh, backward politicians? Well, I, I had three words. I had... Um, Climate change, changing climate, and climate variability. Yeah. And it varied because, again, if you're going to engage in a conversation, you know where you want to be, but you have to start from a position where there's some commonality. Mm. So for me, that, you know, that would be a strategy that I would see as important to try and build trust. And always, it's got to be... The, the bottom line, it's got to be financially viable, it's got to be culturally acceptable, it's got to make a better society for us. Mm. And so you, you think about those. And so some will be long-term issues such as climate change. One that was much more immediate, and you may remember it, was that about four or five dolphins died in the Swan River under mm. my watch was that they lived to about 30 to 40 years of age. So was it just that three or four of them were ready to go to the cetacean next stage? I mean, we didn't know that, but we had to find out. But as a result of that, we've set up Dolphin Watch, which is a wonderful science, um, citizen science program, not only here now in the Swan Canning, but in the Peel Harvey Estuary and in Roebuck Bay. And I would love to see it in other areas too. So some things needed immediate action and others were much more long-term influence. Mm. You don't have power, but you can have influence. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Speaking to that, actually, um, so as a chief science scientist, uh, you, 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 you're part of government, but at the same time, you're, you're in the pursuit of knowledge. Is there any you know, conflicts between this, the, the interests of the state versus 
the interests of someone who is of pursuing fact and knowledge. Yeah, you know, how do you how do you yeah. how do you um, solve yeah. that dilemma? Um, well, at, at a practical level, to start with, I saw I was initially half time in that appointment and yeah. still half time in my academic position. And I immediately said, I can't do that. Mm. I have to because I can't be. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, doing the chief scientist job and the rest of the week competing for space, for equipment, for, for grants. So for me, it was important that the chief scientist job was a full-time job and the government was receptive to that. So I think that's the first stage yeah. because not all jurisdictions do it that way, but I actually think it's really important. So that was the first thing. The second thing is to say that if you're completely lined up with the government, you can't give truly independent advice. But you have to be aware that people are working to a timetable, to a budget, and it has to be something that, for the public, they were going to understand. I mean, it might not be something that immediately they would want to embrace, but they have to see the logic, see where it's going, to see why you're taking that position. So for me, that was where the translating and communicating came in to as well. So although some aspects of the job required confidentiality, and so they should, as much as possible, I would share what I was doing and why I was doing it and what the de how the decisions had been made with the community. And I did it via the media, you know, the fourth estate, either electronic media or, I mean, I, I had a, a Twitter page, for example. I hadn't ever thought of doing that, <laughs> but that was important. And I tried to be as accessible as possible. And the other thing I did was I felt very strongly that I wasn't chief scientist for Perth. I was chief scientist for the whole of WA. Mm. And I needed to visit the regions, know the regions, and know that exceptional people there who were doing really innovative stuff but sometimes it was hard to get those conversations heard and so for me that was important too and the fact that I had the support to be able to do that meant that I think I could support all sorts of areas you know agriculture resources education you name it all of them by being aware that issues that would apply, say, in Kununurra will be very different from those in Kalgoorlie or Esperance. There'll be some common themes, but, but they, there will be regional opportunities and challenges. So it was putting all those into the mix, trying to prioritise them and get things done so that you could, you could see short-term, medium-term goals being reached but also not compromising and hopefully helping a long-term transition. Apart from anything else, when I became chief scientist, it was getting science in everybody's mind. And that was one of the things that I took most seriously that people would say to me, oh, I didn't know we had a chief scientist in WA because I was <laughs> only the second one. But after seven years, <laughs> I think everybody knew we had a chief scientist because increasingly I would get invitations to events. I'd have invitations across the regions. Um, visiting schools is always a good way to share your message. Talking to rotary clubs, visiting the shires and talking to the mayors there, talking to politicians. It was all of that was sharing how important science is for the future of our state. Was there anything um, to that end where you know you were constantly kind of frustrated, like you could see how easy it would be to improve the the state of science in WA, but you know there was, uh, I guess, resistance or just um, you know blockers that you know you you would look at it and go, oh, if only we could do this one simple thing, we could we could really improve things. I think what. One of the things is getting those four legs on the table working better. Mm. So my thought was a table is stable with four legs or three legs, but not with two. So for me, getting, for example, industry and academe together is really important. 
because academics have great ideas, they have resources of equipment and the like, and they have the next generation, they're being trained up for the jobs. And industry has requirements that allow them, for example, to take placements. I hear you do that with your students. Yes, How wonderful. Yeah, we do. So we get that greater interaction. And for me, that was a huge opportunity. There were things I wanted to do within that realm that haven't happened and I pushed for them and I'm still pushing for them, but I could see things were getting better. So I think frustration is always part of the job because you're always trying to reach out further than you you are right now. Mm -hmm. And it's convincing people that it's a win-win. It's not got to be, if it's good for one side, not the other, don't do it. But if, if you can get three legs of the table working together, say industry and academe, and then involving the community in a project, or government, community, you know, um, academe. So often I see community groups doing wonderful work and then asking for government support for them, community projects, for example. And you will ask people, well, is this working? And they'll say, well, we think it is. Well, for me, that's not enough. You should be involving a university to actually give you the hard data, look at mm. it. And then you can go back and say, yes, we have a peer reviewed publication on this that shows investing in this has worked then you're going to get even more support. So that was one of the things that I always wanted to stitch together. Mm. How could industry assist better? Well, because obviously we come from the industry perspective. Well, certainly the sort of placements you're doing, job opportunities, mm. the number of times I heard, well, I haven't had experience, so they won't give me a job, and I go away and get experience, and Western Australia's lost me. So mm. opportunities to get placements for industry. I work a lot with young people on the autism spectrum to help that to happen and they are awesome and they have so many IT talents but there are so many good young people who just need that experience, that taste of what it's like to work in industry. Mm. So I think that's one of them. A project that I would love to see happening and you mentioned frustrations that hasn't happened yet is industry fellowships that are, are very successful in Britain where people hold joint appointments between um, industry and an academic institution. We have chairs that are funded by industry, and that's great. But I would love to see people, and it, as I say, it works very well in Britain, spending part of their time in academe and part in industry. Both ends win by that. And I'll give you an example. Do you remember a few years ago a Qantas plane got in a bit of trouble because an engine started falling off on a trip from, I think it was Singapore, it was down to Sydney. They successfully landed the plane because we know how wonderful Qantas is, but they needed to find out you know, why mm -hmm. it had failed. And the report came through extremely quickly. It came through quickly because three of the industry fellows working with the relevant I can't remember which of the um, aeronautical industries it was, but one of them just dropped everything they were doing, took that project on, found where the metal fatigue was, found where the part that, had, that needed a, um, attention, and it happened. So that's an example of actually being able to step up and put industry and academic links together because a lot of the equipment they used and a lot of the ideas came immediately from the academic world but were applicable straight away to that situation. But beyond that, the idea that industry can gain access to the ideas, the best students, and, and see that. And one of the issues Australia has is that we are not always great at translating what happens in unis across to industry, and I would still love to see those industry fellowships happen. There seems to be such a miscommunication between the two. Well, for example, in Britain, I think almost half of all PhDs are funded by industry, and that oh, seems wow. to be working very well. Yeah. Um, certainly you have to have a certain, a lot of blue sky research, but when you think about the number of people coming out of unis, not a large percentage will stay as academics. Hmm. So to have those skill sets but be able to apply them, I think we just have to keep working on getting those interactions more positive. They're there, but they, I think they need to grow. And looking around the world at 
programs that do work. Um, Britain, I think, has been a good example recently. Could it be a danger in WA, though, um, considering most industry here is mining related, uh, and and the focus would then be on PhDs, you know, to that end, trying to. But I think the thing about a PhD or even a first degree is you are learning how to prog- um, problem solve. Yeah. You are learning how to solve a problem, and it might be in a completely different area. So I'll give you an example. A wonderful lady that I helped find her, her dream job, and her PhD was on um, analyzing the ice cores from Antarctica. Wow. Uh, she then moved into the resources sector. She's now working in the health sector. Oh, wow. And I think this is the other thing that we need to really make sure that people coming through the educational system realize is that they are being trained for a job that probably doesn't exist yet. Yeah. Your jobs wouldn't have existed <laughs> when I came through. And that what you have learned is how to problem solve and how to adjust to situations and see opportunities Mm. and you have to think outside the box so resources sector might be hugely important and it always will be of course but the technology we have there can be applied in my case you know i come from the neuroscience background trying to get people to recover from brain damage what are we looking at we're looking at things like biomechatronics to help people walk again very similar technology to an automated mind site so it's the spill over is huge. Mm. And you only have to look at the space industry over the last 50 years to see how much people have said, well, why go to the moon or now why go to Mars? The technology we use now was was driven by needs to answer questions there, even down to better quality baby food, would you believe it? Which oh, is, wow. that has happened as a result of developing the right diets for people in space. So it's... That's As, fantastic. I didn't cons- know that. If you can see the crossover between areas, and I guess that's the other thing that I would really love to see happening more and more, and I think unis are very getting much better at this, that you do get an education which goes across even you know beyond the sciences into the arts as well, yeah. uh, because um, philosophy, all the other aspects because it's learning how to learn and problem solve. It's not to become an expert. You might become an expert on Jane Austen or, or on nuclear physics, but it's the fact that you can use those skills in new and imaginative ways. Mm. Stepping back a bit um, in, in a academic's life, uh, back to when they're in school, I wanna ask you about the, the pathway to uh, tertiary education. Yes. Um, so you, sp- you spoke about 11 plus. Um, oh, yes. A story coming. Storm right back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know much about 11 plus, but I know here. I'm glad you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know how it compares to education today in WA. Um, when I was in school, we had the TEE. It's ATAR now, I believe, for years yeah. 11 and 12. But some students don't even make it to that point. So, you know, is it for students that have it, the thing that they need to become great at STEM, does the system support them to make them achieve that, to allow them to achieve that? I think it's beginning to. Mm. Mm. And one example I will give is a wonderful group I work with through Curtin University, which is the Autism Academy. So we have wonderful young people with amazing IT skills, but they might not fulfill the requirements for sort of English. You know, they Mm. could write a computer program, but they might not be able to write a short novel. Well if they can get into university using the skill sets that are appropriate for their degree and then they can get some more general education as they go along, so always believe in that, then we're not missing out on those. And increasingly, the universities are looking at the skill sets and being less prescriptive in their requirements for entry. You have to prove in some other way that Mm. you have the skills you need. But I think the more that happens, the better because I think that allows for the diversity and it goes back to my comment about not how smart you are, but how you're smart. Because mm. people can be, don't ask me to, to sing an opera. I couldn't, but I, you know, I have skills in other ways and everybody has skills. So I think we are embracing that more and more. I also like the idea it doesn't depend on just w- one exam that you know you take the cumulative work that a student has done 
because some flourish in exams and others don't. Um, so f for me, and also the pick and mix that I see students now doing unusual combinations of subjects at school they hadn't done before, that wouldn't have been science or humanities, but now people are mixing far more, and I think that's really good. What I would say is encourage students to do things they have a passion for and make sure that particularly the girls know that they can make it in science, technology, engineering mm. and maths because I still get some who aren't sure if, if it's for them, if they could do it. I even got asked once, if I become a scientist, will I ever have a boyfriend? And I said, well, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I even married him. <laughs> but, you know, imagine that girls are still asking you these things. But Where do these misconceptions come from? I, I, I wouldn't know. Hmm. You know. Do you have any idea? Is it, is it the media, social media? Just is it society. Society in general. Like decades, hundreds of years even. Yeah, I yeah, mean, it's interesting. You, know, you only have to go into a toy shop and see the pinks well, and blues. That's what I wanted to talk to you about, actually, because I've just had a daughter. She's um, nine months old. And uh, I'm already excited about buying her, like, Meccano sets, <laughs> which is what I had as a kid. I don't, I don't know what the latest and greatest is. I will soon. But I, I've seen all the, um, like, little um, little science experiment kits and all those kind of things, and like, I've already got a massive list of everything brilliant, I'm going to buy. Brilliant. But I still kind of... My there's, partner's there's wonderful books like Astrophysics for Babies by yeah, those. And I've, I've, <laughs> I've, uh, I've also got uh, Philosophy for Babies, which um, Brilliant. I'm excited well done. about. Uh, Most well-educated baby ever. <laughs> well, I've also got uh, there's a really great book that's Simple Explanations for Complex Things. Oh, I'd love that because I have to have things sim well, that are simple. <laughs> the, uh, the book only uses, I think it's like the 100 most common words in the English oh, language. That's it? Awesome. So no, it's not I can't describe anything using um, academic words. It has to Good. Be plain I'm all English. for that. Yes. Uh, so I've got that. Uh, but I still I still run into conversations even with my partner where she's kind of like that's for boys. And she doesn't mean to, but there's still that you know and I'm like she, look, she can still play with Barbies. I don't mind. <laughs> but I want her to learn, you know. So and I, you know, I I I just don't see toys and things like that being gendered i think it's ridiculous i think girls can girls should be able to play with matchbox cars and barbies absolutely. and science kids right absolutely how do we get past this like how, how do we, how does society grow the hell up i think all kids love science yeah. I, I remember david attenborough when he was um interviewed by barack obama said every kid loves nature and mm. they do but somehow along the way and we know that if we want to engage young people in science we probably have to get them before they leave primary school yes because they have a very open and interested mind and then somehow we just we lose some of them and we have to have to keep that going and we have to say to them you know you don't have to be a nerdy scientist on your own it's it's okay mm. to love science and some kids will want to plant things in the garden others will want to watch the stars you know th th these aren't gender specific things but all kids are interested in them um, i remember our youngest came along and said she was looking for brian and i said who's brian we don't have any friends called brian she was pointing at oh ryan and she hadn't <laughs> she thought That's he cool. was called brian fantastic um you know so <laughs> And I guess my, my husband's a medico, so you know there was a fair bit of sort of sciencey conversation going on. But whatever you're doing, and if you're cooking, you know, I was cooking yesterday with my granddaughters. Well, what's in baking powder? You know, what does yeast do when you add it to bread? Um, you know, how do you make mayonnaise so a colloid doesn't separate? You know, it does doesn't really matter. These aren't gender specific anymore. Hmm. But if you certainly, I had th have three girls, and and they all did science, but they all did science in a completely different way. One is a vet. The second one works with young people with autism, and the third one is a journalist. Oh wow! Uh, science but, journalist or um, double qualified in English and uh, zoology, as it happens. Oh, fantastic! Uh, so you know, although they they're doing completely disparate jobs now. They've all had that that 
training and exposure. Mm. But the fact that Kate, for example, studied English and zoology, I thought, and could in those, I don't know if you still can, but at that point at her uni, you could count the overlapping subjects that could be art or science, say psychology and anthropology would be examples, maybe linguistics, mm. and you could count them in each degree. So you could, it, it was sort of like doing one and a half or one <laughs> yeah. and two thirds degrees. <laughs> but that gave her such a wonderful edge because she can write really well, yet mm. she can ring up the Department of Fisheries and have a conversation about the statistics of how you work out the fishing quotas. I know, I know a big focus is to bring more people through the university system. Uh, do you have any concerns about degree inflation? It's because in, um, in the United States, there's some issues with everyone going to university, everyone getting a degree, and everyone ha- getting stuck with degrees, and suddenly there's this, it's just harder to find work. So what are your opinions on that? Well, first of all, I'm a huge supporter of the TAFE system, and that was mm. one of the things I really pushed when I was chief scientist, mm. because I think that... It's a fantastic opportunity. And whether it leads to a university or a university leads to TAFE, that's one of the things that I would love to see more integrated because I think it teaches practical skills as well as as the theory. So my daughter, who who is working with young people with autism, um, did a childcare course at TAFE before she did degrees at university in early childhood studies and then in education. Putting those together, her, her comment when she walked in and was uh, told as deputy director of a kindy and was told by the director, here are the keys, I'm off for the afternoon. Kate <laughs> said, sorry, Jenny said she wouldn't have got through that but for a TAFE training as well. Mm. So I think that we should see them as as two hands clapping, not as something that's one or the other. The two Mm. working together are so much better. So I think that's really important. Again, if we can at university see it as a training in how to think, then, or at TAFE, it doesn't matter which it is, and you'll gain information too if you're in the workforce, but I'm all for more training, but I'm often in favor not only of of a full degree, but for example, going back and gaining extra skill sets. So for example, if you're going to become a lawyer, it's highly likely you are going to have to understand an awful lot of health, environment, resources, you name it, because they are all science related and to understand the significance of the word significant. For example, we say, is it significant? What well, does that mean that it fulfills a statistical requirement? Or does it mean, well, most people care a bit about it? Mm. So I, I think, again, because jobs are evolving, going back and, re- and building on your skill sets are really important. So my answer would be never stop learning, never stop gaining more skills formally or informally um, and do what what's the right course for you and do it at the right time for you more and more people are going back doing degrees later or or adding to their skill set as it's needed and I think that's that's a great way forward and the more support we can give to that and for example people from industry coming back so they can do higher degrees Mm and then be back in in their workforce. You know, these are, this goes back to the previous thing about this intersection of industry with academe, making it much more user friendly for the two sides. And that is happening and COVID's helped that along the way. Paradoxically, it's probably helped it a fair bit. You're you're pretty active in the non-profit space. That's exactly where I was going to go to. Exclusively. Yeah, so yeah, I'd like yeah. to just ask, just maybe start from a high level. Uh, what nonprofits are you involved in? So we, we've got oh the list gosh. here, and it's a lot. So yeah, I think so let's, um, let's start high level and just. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd like to like to. I'd like to know about your motivations into this kind of space, and what do you see in these nonprofits? And uh, you're on a lot of boards, which um, looks. Uh, I, 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 I'm on a few boards, and it, it's it's a lot of work, even Sorry. even when you're not actually doing anything you're still well I'm not collecting a salary but I think I'm busy (laughs) yeah (laughs) Um. in no in no order at all and uh, no disrespect to anyone that's not mentioned um, what's your 
what does it look like in in, in well, I'd, what what would I say yes to and what wouldn't I say yeah, yes to yeah. that sort of thing um, my main drive is to help well kids uh, kids who wouldn't have a chance otherwise so we or, actually or met limit you. their chances yeah we we met you game changer awards exactly uh, so which you're a patron of i'm honored yeah. to be that reaching out to schools where we have great science teachers doing and lab technicians doing a wonderful job but that extra bit of help and support that extra recognition for the students and their achievements and stretching their minds so if it's science related and and kids, mm. I'm in. Yeah. Mm. Um, I'm also in because I want a better, or, or to maintain our precious biodiversity and our environment. So I'm on the Parks Foundation. I'm co-patron of the Naturalist Club. You know, for me, it's important that we don't lose the wonderful biodiversity we have here. Because my background was in biomedical research, then I, I'm keen to give back because I believe that that research, clearly medical research, is hugely important, not only for the cures that, that that become possible, but to allow us to have the best health system we can. Because if you want really great doctors, nurses, physios, and the like, a fair proportion of those will want to be involved in research too. Yeah. And therefore, a hospital, particularly a teaching tertiary hospital, will see the priorities not only as patient care, that's always first, of course, but teaching, hugely important, but research too. And so for me, being involved in the research aspects are, are really, that's a huge opportunity. Supporting women, um, not to the exclusion of men. I'm, I'm women-focused, men-friendly, because I... <laughs> I, I don't see it as a competition. I see it as working together. Mm. But being involved with women's uh, initiatives is something that I'm I'm keen to support. I, I'm involved in two organisations: Women in Technology WA and Financial Toolbox, both of which are there to Financial Toolbox. What's what's okay. that? Uh, sorry, so I'm I'm familiar with Whitwa. Um, okay. They do some great work, but they I actually do. haven't heard of Financial Toolbox. Oh, good! It's a chance to tell you about it. So. <laughs> When I was lucky enough to be the, chief, the um, West Australia of the Year in 2015, I went to Canberra. But I was pretty sure I wasn't going to win because I knew who needed to win and I hoped would win, and that was Rosie Batty. How important was that? Rosie Batty in 2015 was Australian of the Year. Mm -hmm. She had a very sad story of um, her son Luke being killed in front of her eyes by an estranged partner. That really gave a really big push along to the whole appreciation of of addressing the issue of domestic violence yeah. and led to initiatives which are re-engaged again now by the current debates. Mm -hmm. So I talked to Rosie Batty and said, what could I do in WA? And she said, most women who go back to abusive situations, two thirds of them do, and they do it because the financial mm. purse strings are, are controlled by the partner. Yeah, right. And anything you could do to help get more financial literacy to women. So we set up the financial toolbox. It does two things. We do workshops where people pro bono, lawyers, accountants, superan experts, experts in wills, you name it, um, come and give workshops to women. But the second thing we do is we have an online uh, program called Your Toolkit, which is to help women at risk of financial and or domestic violence abuse, and the two often go together. Uh, to strategize how they might improve the situation so maybe they wouldn't have to leave or if they are going to, what to do immediately before you leave an abusive situation immediately after and the long term so you can thrive. And we were getting about 100 hits a day on our website before COVID. It shot up to 5,000 almost overnight. Wow. Oh, shit, really? So, absolutely. So... And we've had to update it a lot, of course, when mm. Job Seeker and, and Job Keeper came mm. along to keep it relevant. We're just a, a volunteer group, 
um, we're, lo- we're now funded by Lottery West. We're very grateful for that. And with right. some industry support, although we're always looking for more support because we think that women should have more financial know-how. Mm. And I don't necessarily want women to be rich, but I do want them to know that, you know, the fact that 45% of them have no superan, women have 45% less superan than men, 45% of all homeless uh, in WA are women. You probably wouldn't realize that, but they couch surf or car surf. And 45% of homeless women are Aboriginal, so put those four 45s together, and that's why I'm a great supporter of the financial toolbox and toolkit. Yeah, that's fantastic. Mm. And so, you see, this isn't science per se, but for me, it's, and in fact, you know, it it crosses all walks of life, including academic women. Well, leveling the playing field would increase. Well, we have the biggest salary gap in Australia at at just about 23%, whereas in Victoria and South Australia, it's 9%. So I know that there are some industries here that we would say might make it more difficult to get that gap reduced. But by gosh and golly, that doesn't sound right, does it? No. No, it doesn't. Oh, can I just say I love cricket? That'd be the other thing I'd want to say. Okay, let's, yeah. let's, let's jump into let's that. Let's talk about cricket. Okay, so the, the thing I'm interested in, apart from the fact that I love cricket, and I loved it since a kid, my dad used to take me um, to watch Kent play, mm-hmm. and I've always, you know, supported cricket here. I've, I'm working with a group now to get more young people on the autism spectrum who love cricket getting the opportunity to play and be involved in matches and it's called where there's a will and um it's an initiative called the last over and will's mum will is 25 and will loves cricket and he goes along every time and they are organizing now something called the last over which is beginning to catch on whereby at the end of the formal part of the match then both teams and people from the um, crowd, if they'd like to, and they can, go on the pitch and Will is the star and he bowls or bats or whatever he'd like to for the last over. And it's that recognition of inclusiveness. Um, There's going to be an exhibition down in Bunbury, um, I think the 18th of April, next week on Sunday, where we are going to be launching a program where cricket bats are donated and famous people paint them and then we sell them to raise money for awareness of young people on the autism spectrum so it's it's the bats program and it's the last over to help recognition because you know between one in 68 and one in 100 depending on your um uh diagnoses but that's the number of young people being born today on the spectrum and they all have so much to give Mm. and that's one example of how we can build awareness and enthusiasm and certainly your industry without people like well obviously started you can think of of Isaac Newton and then Einstein and Steve Jobs and they almost certainly were all on the spectrum Mm, as, as were people such as Hans Christian Andersen where will we be without his beautiful stories. So that's one of the big things that I want to support. And that's how it, it overlaps with my interest in cricket. So I don't know <laughs> if that'll come if that'll come off, but that's one of my current initiatives that I'm pushing. That's fantastic. Isn't that nice? So yeah. I'll be be down in Bunbury. Hi guys in Bunbury. All right. I think um I think we can wrap it up. Well thank you very much, gentlemen. It's well, been an absolute pleasure and thank you for all the work you're doing to spread the message about science, technology, engineering and maths and engaging with young people and encouraging well, diversity. And may your daughter grow up to be <laughs> exactly what she wants to be That's and right. give back. Yeah, <laughs> Whatever sure it will. is, whether she's an opera singer she, or, or an astrophysicist. I can I can already <laughs> see the drive in her and she's only nine <laughs> months old, so I think there's no doubt there. Tell, uh, her to, tell her to follow her passion. Yes. Well, I did, and um, and that's why we're here today. <laughs> that's exactly uh, right. I can see it in your faces. <laughs> so we, we end every interview with a whimsical question. Um, so I, I don't know how much of a fan of, of wrestling or um, <laughs> or professional fighting you are, 
But the fighters have a character, right? And they, when they come out to fight and the lights go down and the smoke machines start, their, their song plays and it personifies their character and introduces them to the audience. What is Lynn Beasley's intro song? So if you, let's say you're giving the keynote and the organizer asks you, what song would you like to play with the smoke machine and the, and the lasers and the light machi- lights machines? Uh, before you come out on stage, what is your intro song? I still call Australia home. Ah, nice. Perfect. Excellent. Yeah, classic. <laughs> Fantastic. And you didn't take long to think about it either. Beautiful. Excellent. All right. All right. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, Bye. thank you so much. That was a real pleasure. You've made it to the end of another episode of Tech Society. Well, that was a great episode. I hope you enjoyed that as much as we enjoyed making it. Make sure you hit us up on Twitter, at Tech Society. Head over to the website, subscribe to the newsletter. And on this month in tech history, May 17, 1991, the first server, web server, in history is set up by Tim Berners-Lee on a next cube at CERN, the European Particle Physics Laboratory in Switzerland. The launch of this server is considered the first public release of the World Wide Web.